a fundamental law of thermodynamics is that nothing in the universe is created or destroyed, which means all the nutrients necessary for life have to be recycled. The nutrients that make life possible never really go away. Everything in ecosystems gets recycled. The earth is a closed system, which means nothing really gets in or out of the planet. However, there is one big exception, and that's sunlight. And sunlight is the primary source of energy for the planet, and not only does it drive photosynthesis, it also ends up being the primary source of energy for all the other biogeochemical cycles as well. Before we look at how elements actually cycle through the environment, we're going to need to go through a few definitions so you can make sense of these. Biogeochemical cycles are how elements essential for living things move through the environment. Many elements will find themselves in every sphere of the earth, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the lithosphere. Then everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked and the biosphere. Reservoirs are places where an element has a long residency time, or the amount of time that element is held in that place. For example, the ocean is a reservoir of water in the hydrological cycle. Anytime an element changes phase or undergoes a chemical reaction and moves from one sphere to another, it is said to flux. Flux means movement or flow. For example, photosynthesis is a means for carbon to flux from the atmosphere, where it's stored as carbon dioxide, into the biosphere, where it is stored as glucose and carbohydrates. All fluxes have sources in sinks. In the example of photosynthesis, the source of carbon is the atmosphere, and the sink for carbon is, well, plants or the biosphere. Fluxes occur from sources to sinks, and realistically speaking, any reservoir of an element is usually both a source or a sink. It just depends where the net movement of an element is or out. If it is moving in, you are going to a sink. If an element is moving out, you are moving from a source. When we're talking about the carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycles, it's important to remember that each element can be part of a different molecule during each step. For example, during the carbon cycle, the carbon that is found inside the molecule, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, after photosynthesis, the carbon from CO2 is now one of the carbon atoms found inside the glucose that was produced. Let's start with the carbon cycle. And the carbon cycle is the movement of the atoms and molecules containing the element carbon between sources and sinks. A cycle doesn't have a start or an end point. Resources in the universe are recycled in perpetuity, but I like to begin the carbon cycle with the atmosphere. And the most common form of carbon in the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere in two ways. During photosynthesis, the carbon from CO2 ends up being part of glucose or sugar inside plants. This can also happen with phytoplankton and algae in the ocean, which are also photosynthetic. The glucose can then be further moved through the biosphere through food webs as one organism consumes another. Carbon dioxide can also diffuse into bodies of water, where it undergoes a chemical reaction with the water, forming carbonic acid. All living things use energy and undergo respiration, and yes, even plants. Respiration is how the carbon and glucose ends up back in the atmosphere as CO2 again. However, respiration is not the only way that carbon can return to the atmosphere. It can also come from the eruption of volcanoes, forest fires, decomposition, and of course everyone's favorite, the combustion of fossil fuels. But how did the fossil fuels get into the ground? Well, for that we have to go back to our phytoplankton plants and decomposing dead stuff. After some time, those organisms, or at least some organic compounds within those organisms, sink to the bottom of the ocean and get buried. This is a process called sedimentation, where layers of material build up on top of each other. Over extremely long periods of time, this sedimentation causes extreme amounts of pressure, which produces rocks and a few other compounds. As a result of this sedimentation and compression, we get the fossil fuels that we use for energy, coal, oil, and natural gas. The lithosphere, especially in rocks, end up having the largest residency time for carbon. And humans are disrupting that residency by removing carbon, burning it, and putting all of that into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide or other carbon molecules like methane. 
Now let's get into the nitrogen cycle. And I'm going to be honest. I find the nitrogen cycle to be a little tricky to understand completely because there's a lot of new terms and processes. So follow along as best you can and we'll get through this one together. The nitrogen cycle is the way that nitrogen or molecules containing nitrogen cycle through the environment from sources to sinks. Now the nitrogen cycle is what we call a fast cycle because the reservoirs of nitrogen don't really have a particularly long residency time for the element in any of its various forms. Before we get into the cycle, there are a couple of terms and processes that I want you to know the definitions for beforehand. Nitrogen fixation is the process of taking nitrogen gas in the atmosphere and converting it into ammonia. And this can be done in two ways. The most common way is that bacteria facilitate the process. We call it nitrogen fixing bacteria and they take nitrogen gas from the atmosphere and convert it to ammonia and end up releasing that into the soil. This process can also happen through lightning. Lightning can also fix nitrogen into ammonia. Then there's the process nitrification, where ammonia is converted into a different molecule called a nitrate, and this process is also facilitated through bacteria that we call nitrifying bacteria. Now nitrification is an important process because some plants are better adapted at assimilating ammonia, and some plants are better adapted to assimilating nitrates, and this is also true for aquatic ecosystems with algae. Denitrification is a process by which nitrates are converted back into nitrogen gas that ends up going into the atmosphere. And catch this, this process is also facilitated by a bacteria that we collectively refer to as denitrifying bacteria. The key here is when you're thinking about nitrogen, I really want you to think about microbes. Bacteria facilitate a huge amount of this cycle. And now that we have the definitions out of the way, let's get into it. The nitrogen compound found in the atmosphere is usually nitrogen gas, and it can be fluxed from the atmosphere through nitrogen fixing bacteria, or it can be fixed through lightning. Now that we've got ammonia probably in the soil, nitrification can occur, where bacteria take the ammonia and convert it into nitrates. Both ammonia and nitrates can be assimilated by plants and algae, and once that nitrate is assimilated, plants can use the nitrogen inside those molecules to build molecules that are important to them that contain nitrogen. Things like DNA and proteins, they all require some source of nitrogen to be synthesized. Nitrogen can move further through the biosphere as one organism eats another, and those proteins are broken down to create new proteins. Mr. W, for example, eats a lot of protein, so my body can digest them and rearrange all the nitrogen-containing amino acids to make new proteins in my muscles so I can get jacked and pick up cars, which is actually something I, I really do. Okay. If an organism dies, those proteins and body tissues are broken down to some nitrogen-containing molecule by decomposers and returned back to the soil. At the end of this entire cycle, nitrates and ammonia can be denitrified and returned back into the atmosphere as nitrogen gas. Now, much like how our use of fossil fuels has disrupted the carbon cycling on the planet, humans have disrupted the nitrogen cycle as well. We use a process called the Haber-Bosch process in which we synthetically make ammonia that becomes part of our fertilizers. And through the use of fertilizer, we artificially increase the amount of nitrogen that ends up getting assimilated by plants. But we're going to get more into the consequences of that in the unit on agriculture. The phosphorus cycle is the way the element phosphorus, or molecules containing phosphorus, cycle through the environment between sources and sinks. As opposed to the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle is actually a very slow cycle. And that's because the major reservoir of phosphorus is actually rock. And that takes quite a while to weather down. The most common naturally occurring phosphorus containing molecule is phosphate. And to be fair, you can get away with knowing just that. Now, because the process is slow, phosphorus in most ecosystems ends up being a limiting resource. With the phosphorus cycle, I want to start with the mountains over there because they contain rocks that have minerals that contain phosphorus. Now, when it rains, a process called weathering occurs where little tiny bits of this phosphorus is being washed away and it runs off into soil or bodies of water and it, uh, it gets deposited somewhere else. That phosphorus can now be assimilated by plants and of course plants use the phosphorus they have assimilated to build molecules that require phosphorus, like the backbone of DNA. Phosphorus can then move further through food webs as one organism consumes another. 
Organisms require phosphorus not only for their own DNA, but also because phosphorus, especially for animals, is important for maintaining our bone structure and the health of our teeth. Of course, after some time, the phosphorus can then be incorporated back into the lithosphere as things die, decompose, and pile on top of each other. Humans have affected the phosphorus cycle as well. Because it is a limiting resource in many ecosystems and it is necessary for plant growth, we have been adding it to our fertilizers. And again, artificially increasing the amount of phosphorus that is being assimilated by plants. Now, the hydrological cycle, or the water cycle, is probably the one you are most familiar with. Right? It's how water moves throughout the environment. Now, this entire cycle is powered by the sun. I mentioned earlier that the Earth is a closed system, with the exception of solar radiation, and it really is the sun that allows all these cycles and processes to occur, but most especially for the water cycle. Let's get started with the water cycle with evaporation. We know that water can go from the hydrosphere into the atmosphere through the process of evaporation. Plant cells store water, and when they lose that water, we call that transpiration. Most commonly, the water is almost immediately evaporated off of the leaf, and we have a special term for this combined process, evapotranspiration. Please do not underestimate this flux. Transpiration is a massive movement of water, and in some places, like in the Amazon rainforest, transpiration alone is enough to create entire weather systems. Water can also enter the atmosphere a third way by going directly from its solid ice stage into the gas phase through a process called sublimation. Of course, now that we have water in the atmosphere, it can condense into clouds and then fall as rain, which we call precipitation. Sometimes instead of rain, the water falls as snow on top of mountains. And then spring comes and all that snow starts to melt and that water runs off. Oh, that's another process. There is water runoff. While water running on top of the land is called runoff, when the water gets into the ground, we call that infiltration, the process by which water infiltrates into the ground. When the water actually gets into the ground, it doesn't stop moving. It percolates through the ground. And percolation is how water moves through the ground. And this is important because the ground actually contains a large amount of water. We call it groundwater, or sometimes it's in a larger deposit called an aquifer. Infiltration of water and then percolation into sources of groundwater is an important part of the water cycle, especially since many parts of the world and the central U.S. rely on groundwater as a primary source of drinking water and irrigation for crops. Of course, we know that the ocean is the largest reservoir of water, but that salt water is not really accessible to us. Ice caps are the largest reservoir of fresh water, but we don't really have access to the ice caps for drinking water. So we rely on freshwater sources, especially groundwater and lakes, for a large amount of our human anthropogenic water use. And those are the cycles you need to know for AP Environmental Science. But now, go explore the outside. Carbon dioxide all can the Carbon dioxide can also...